Next up we have Peter West talking about feral scan, community-based invasive species monitoring, lessons learned from landholder landholder co-design and future direction. Thanks, Talia. <coughs> That's a long, uh, long title. Um, I work for an organisation, I work in New South Wales for New South Wales Government, but for an organisation called the Invasive Animal CRC, but we've just recently changed our organisation to uh, the Centre for Invasive Species Solutions. Uh, the Feral Scan program has been around for a few years, and the reason it really was developed was to um, address a growing need for improved information about um, some of the major, well established, and high impacting invasive species in Australia. We're familiar with foxes and rabbits and all those, but there are a myriad of different species. Um, and I'll just talk to you about what the program has offered over the last couple of years. Um, there has been a number of regional partners, a number of state governments, a bit of federal funding, um, and we were very fortunate to pick up a Banksia Award a few years ago for this, so I'm very pleased with that. Most important for us was to have that industry partner. So we've got Australian Wool Innovation as one of our driving um, industry groups. The resource evolved as a website with species-based mapping platforms, enabling people with, with very little understanding of how to drive web mapping tools to communicate about pests in their local area. Um, we evolved the tool over time. Um, whoops, we evolved the tool over time to become a, a mobile platform and a mobile app. I'll show you in a second. But the, the species here are high um, impacting widely established pest species in Australia. And what you might learn from this process today is that the scope of this actually um, is, you know, the scope for this is actually well beyond established pest species. Uh, it's been around for a few years. We've started to build a database of sightings, um, damage records such as attacks on livestock by wild dogs, um, as well as impacts, uh, sorry, as well as control actions. So we're trying to develop a culture and develop a, a process with landholders and community groups around the country to document problems and use that information to guide where they're doing targeted pest management control. Um, the user base is quite um, substantial, but I think we have a lot to learn and a lot to do there. I, you know, there are a lot of people in this country that are being impacted on by pest species at the moment. Um, one of the bottom points there is the capacity of these sorts of technologies to alert key audiences or key people about the risks and the threat that pest species pose in their local area. We designed some of the website technology to be very simple and easy to use. Um, you know, fairly intuitive for most people to go into the, pros into the program and record data. It's a national resource, so anybody who can record data anywhere, you don't have to be a ratepayer or a associated with a farming group, you can, um, people participate in every area. Um, this is just where um, people are using the Wild Dog Scan program to document the impacts of dogs in their local area. We started with a blank piece of paper to decide how to develop the Feral Scan app. So we went to landholder groups and said, what do you want this app to do and how do you want it to function? And so we started, we came from the bottom up in, in that respect and that's where it's been really successful. Um, you know, this is a, an example of the sort of data that people are collecting on, on wild dogs in their local area, you know, trying to get a better understanding of where animals move, where they do and don't go, where their impacts are occurring and using that information to guide local control. Perhaps most importantly is the capacity of these sorts of tools to actually inform people on a broader scale. So when this is in the Hunter district of New South Wales, where wild dogs attack livestock and people are losing hundreds of animals, hundreds of, um, of um, sheep and lambs each year, where those attacks are taking place, as soon as you record that data, it can ping off a message to a number of people, including biosecurity officers and officers that can help those landholders to react and deal with those issues. We're seeing a lot of popularity with that. Obviously, the, the, the movement of uh, passive infrared cameras is, is certainly enabling a lot of people to detect animals on their land where they've never known that they existed previously. We're trying to tap into the fact that more and more people have, in, including in remote areas, despite the limitations around network connection, tap into the fact that mobile devices can be used more and more as a communication tool on farm, as well as a communication tool with a range of different stakeholders. So the bottom right-hand part of that slide 
is really to illustrate that a farmer can record an incident about wild dogs and have that relayed to a large number of people very, very quickly, and vice versa. Um, here is a situation with, where there's some landholders in southern New South Wales are documenting feral pig problems and impacts on their land. They then use that information to guide where they put control techniques. This is a uh, device called the hog hopper. Um, for me, I think where, where this technology now offers us great opportunities is in terms of incursion detection and response. So tilapia, Mozambique tilapia are a highly invasive species in northern Australia. The red dots represent the current, uh, current incursion points for the fish. They're well established in the north. So we're trying to work with community groups and fishing clubs and fishing associations so whenever they see these sorts of fish documented in feral scan, and it's, that information is then passed on to aquatic biosecurity teams, which is a really important link. Connecting participants to, um, to training, to resources, to new capabilities is really the key because it's all about providing incentives and providing value for people that participate or people that use the system. I'll give you an example, because time's short, I'll give you an example of the, uh, the, some of the science outcomes from one of our elements here. We used um, the rabbit scan program to help deploy the K5 rabbit biocontrol agent last year, which uh, um, was successful in knocking down rabbit populations by about 50 to 58 per cent in many sections of the country. We used the rabbit scan program to develop a biocontrol tracker, asked put a call out to the community to ask for sites to nominate for the release of this virus. It's similar to Khaleesi virus, similar to myxomatosis, but somewhat different. Um, and then those, uh, we had about eight or 900 people put their hands up for that, and, and some people in this room may have been involved in that or know about that. And at those locations, undertake monitoring. So monitoring before and after the release of the virus to measure the outcomes of it. After the virus was released, lots of dead rabbits were turning up. Um, so we, used, we asked the community to record where they were seeing those instances and even to break, you know, go to the effort of dissecting animals and sending in tissue samples. And yes, there might be a few frowns in the crowd, but you'd be surprised lots and lots of people did this. Um, Megan Dixon on the right-hand side looks a little bit too enthusiastic for mine. <laughs> and the, the photo on the left I love because the, the dog in the background is actually looking not at the rabbit, but actually at the app, and, and the use of the app, maybe he's planning to use uh, the app to find more rabbits. So never underestimate the intelligence of dogs. So the rabbit biocontrol tracker, you can now go into this resource and see where some of the major biological control for, what, for rabbits are across this region, and, and you'll see the red dots there are the Korean strain K5, which we've seen in South Australia. Lessons learnt, co-design was really critical for feral scan and was really critical for community adoption. Um, we, need to, we need to grow ownership around this resource and grow ownership around the pest problem, pest animal problem. Um, I've always sort of struggled with this balance between end user needs <coughs> and things like data requirements or, or science requirements. And I've been, you know, tending more towards the end user, end user side of things. So as an example, you know, people said the feral scan app should be designed to provide people with an option to record these 28 different variables. But the community is saying, well, we're only really prepared to record two or three. So trying to find that balance and trying to, trying to find a happy medium between them is the real challenge. Um, with the Feral Scan app, we tried to, try to do that as best we can. Um, planning for end user adoption is really critical. Um, I, I, you know, I've found that managing expectations of users and all the stakeholders that are interested in Pest species data was, was quite challenging. Um, communication is certainly an area that you've heard more, a lot of already and you'll hear more about over the next few days. We had to invest a lot in communication about this resource, what it offers, when it offers, who it offers to, how can it be used, when, what are the limitations around it. This is something I, I suspect we don't really know a great deal about. Um, motivations for users. So we've had about you know, 30 or 40,000 people interact with Feral Scan from all walks of life in Australia, and we just don't, haven't got a full grasp on what their motivations for getting involved actually are. So that's something we need to learn more about. Um, ultimately, we know that participants want meaningful and valuable outcomes either for local control or contribution of data towards improved policy and improved programs. 
um, we need to communicate about what those outcomes are and we, we try and do that as much as we can. The next steps for this sort of work is really to focus on new incursions. So um, you may be aware that there are um, a large number of reptiles, a large number of exotic birds, a large number of exotic fish being kept in captivity. More and more of them are being detected in the wild. There was a bloke here in Adelaide who did some work on um, detection rates of new species in Australia and found that um, state government biosecurity agencies were finding 10% of the, of the uh, I think it was 10% of the uh, liberations or the instances where, where exotic animals were being released or escaping into the wild. So that's an incredibly low number. So what we're trying to do is think about ways in which we can tap into recreational fishing clubs, bushwalking groups, grey nomads, you know, more and more people to try and try and develop a community where we can improve the probability of detecting these sorts of incursions. Um, American corn snakes, the photo there, is a species which occurs um, in New South Wales. It's an ornamental, uh, people keep it as a pet. It's non-venomous and uh, quite beautiful. Um, but they're being released and being detected in the wild in lots of different areas around, usually around capital cities. So we'll be focusing on new incursions just to see whether we can engage better with the community in that respect. Um, we'll be certainly thinking more about biosecurity risks with invasive species. Data sharing is a big priority. We need to make sure the data that is uh, captured through this program is shared and, and utilised in the best possible way. And one of the key things there is to make it available to all the relevant management organisations and stakeholders. I've referred to developing community networks, but we really need to... Uh, a, a really good example is Port Botany in Sydney at the moment. The New South Wales Government, who I work for, have decided to invest in the community around Port Botany so that if something new turns up, that they've got a high likelihood of finding it and reporting it, which is a really key and empowering activity. Um, red imported fire ants turned up in Sydney and they went undetected for over 12 months. Um, carp biocontrol, if it gets released in 2019, 2020, uh, we hope to play a role with this resource then. And as I said, we really want to learn about what are the motivations for people if we're, if we're going to establish an enduring monitoring framework. Um, there have been a number of people involved. Um, if you'd like to learn more about the Feral Scan resource, please either go to the website. Um, I'll be around for the remainder of today and half of tomorrow. I'd be more than happy to uh, have a chat to you about it. And more importantly, if you can think of applications for this, uh, please let me know. We want to evolve this to meet um, stakeholder and, and community needs. Thank you very much.